Well, this morning, we do return to our study of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. This is probably the most important letter that has ever been written in the history of the world. God has used this letter to literally change the lives of millions and millions of people throughout the ages. It's the basic handbook for Christianity. And if you're serious about growing as a Christian, you have to understand the book of Romans. John Calvin, who formed the Presbyterian Church, said, If you understand the book of Romans, you have the foundation to understand and interpret the entire Bible. Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation after a careful study of the book of Romans where he determined the just shall live by faith, not by the rituals and rules of the church, but by faith. John Wesley started the Wesleyan revivals that resulted in the founding of the Methodist Church as a result of his study of the book of Romans. St. Augustine became a Christian because God used the words of this letter to convict him of sin and point him to the true way of salvation. All throughout history, God has used the book of Romans to powerfully change people's lives. And God can use it to change our lives too. This morning we pick up our study of Romans in the 6th chapter, the 14th verse, as Paul explains who we are in Christ, what that practically means, and how we can live our life as Christians as God intends for us to live. Now, our primary text this morning is Romans 6, 14. It's a very short verse. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. It's a short verse. But it's going to take us two Sundays to cover it. This week, we're going to look at what it means that Christians are no longer under the law. And next week, we're going to talk about what it means that we as Christians now live under grace. Now, in the first section of Romans 6 that I read to you, Paul tells us we're freed from sin because Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. We are, we are, therefore, Paul says, in a very real sense, dead to sin when we respond to his love and become Christians. We're dead to sin because our sinful nature was crucified with him on the cross and buried with him, and we were raised with him and given a new nature. When I baptize people, as I'm going to do this Friday at Hamilton Baptist, I will say, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Baptism is a symbolic enactment of the fact that we go, as we go under the water, our old nature that was crucified with him is buried with him. And when we come out, out, out of the water, it symbolizes our resurrection to a new life in Christ, controlled not by the flesh and not by our sinful human nature, but now by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. In Romans 6, 11, Paul says, as a result, we are to reckon ourselves dead to sin. We are no longer slaves to sin because our old nature has been crucified with Christ. As Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul asserts we are to count ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Now, this is a very important scriptural concept. If you're going to successfully live the Christian life, we need to ask ourselves, have I reckoned myself to be dead to sin and am I working out my salvation as the Bible calls me to do? For it's God that works in you as I cooperate with the Holy Spirit to live a new life that's not dominated by sin, but instead is centered in Christ. We are freed from the power of sin by Christ's death on the cross and raised from the grave with him to live a new life that's empowered and directed by God. That doesn't mean we won't sometimes fall back into sin, but it means we don't have to. The Bible says with any temptation comes a way of escape. We don't have to. We're not bound by sin anymore, and we don't allow our lives to be dominated by sin. We're not satisfied to live that way. Galatians 5.16 says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. This whole concept of, of being dead to sin, it's not an easy concept to grasp. But it's such an important one that we'll be coming back to it several times in the next few weeks because Paul hammers at this point again and again and again in Romans. Romans. 
Now this morning I want us to concentrate on the new freedom that Paul says we not only have from sin, but also from the law. As Romans 6.14 says, for sin will not be your master. Why? Well, Paul says, because you're not under law, but under grace. Now to understand what that means, we first have to ask, what is the law? Well, the Old Testament uh, describes three types of law. First is the ceremonial law. This is the part of law that Moses that dealt, dealt with the Jewish sacrificial system and its rituals, its offerings, its festivals, its food restrictions. Then there's the civil law, that part of the law of Moses that dealt with what, it, what, it, what makes you a Jew, a citizen of Israel, you know, and how do we run this country, the tribes and the, and the jurisdiction, all of these things. And then there was the moral law. This is the part of the law that we're most familiar with, the Ten Commandments, for instance, is a key example of God's moral law, though there are also many other parts of the law of Moses that deals with how we're to behave morally. Because, uh, you know, what Paul says is, is that Christ freed us from the law. And when he says that, he's talking about the fact God has freed us from the ceremonial laws of Judaism and the civil law that govern the nation, but he's not saying that we have no responsibility to keep God's moral law. Now, how do we know that? Well, because Paul wrote another letter to the Galatian Christians that basically explains what Romans 6.14 means. Galatians gives us several descriptions of how the law Christ frees us from, how, how he frees us from the Old Testament law. And the first description I want to point you to is found in Galatians 5.1. There Paul's description of the law and what it means to be free of it, he says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, <clears throat> and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now, notice that phrase, yoke of slavery. If you re read the previous two chapters in Galatians, you're going to find out the yoke of slavery he's talking about is the ceremonial law of Judaism with its requirements for what you can do and can't do, what you can eat and can't eat, what you can drink and can't drink, how you're to worship, and whether or not you have to be circumcised if you're a male in order to be a Christian. The first picture Paul gives us of the Old Testament law is that it's a yoke. Now, a yoke is what you put on oxen to, to control the animals. One purpose of the Old Testament law was to control human behavior, not to change us, but to control us. The law can't change anyone's heart. But when we're in Christ, we're given the Holy Spirit, who God has sent to change us from the inside out, to give us a new heart, as Isaiah prophesied, that he'd give us a new heart, that he'd take out the heart of stone and he'd put in a new heart, and that his laws would be written on our heart. This new heart the Holy Spirit gives us, gives us the desire as the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live our lives as God would have us to live. If you tell me, or most any other human being, you have to do this, or you absolutely cannot do this, our rebellious human nature almost immediately says, or thinks at least, I don't have to do that, or I'm going to do that if I want to. The law, though it's good, tells us what we have to do, what we can't do, but in the process it makes us feel like slaves and we rebel against it, and then the law condemns us, you know, for our rebellion. Now compare what Paul says about the law enslaving us to what Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When you become a Christian, the Bible says you give up the yoke of the law and you take on the yoke of Jesus which uh, the, the, the law, uh, you know, the Old Testament law, it's heavy, it's condemning, it's burdening, it's frustrating. But now we take on the yoke of Jesus, which it, Jesus says is easy and light and gentle. You give up trying to regulate yourself by obeying external laws that stir up rebellion within us, and instead you yield control of your life to Christ, who gently leads us to do the right thing. Paul, Paul describes a second purpose of the law in Galatians 4, 1 through 7. 
I like the paraphrase of this passage in the Living Bible because it accurately and correctly interprets what the verse says in very contemporary English. But remember this, if a father dies and leaves great wealth to a little son, that child is not much better off than a slave until he grows up even though he actually owns everything his father had. He has to do what his guardian and managers tell him to do until he reaches whatever age his father set. And that is the way it is with us before Christ came. We were slaves to Jewish laws and rituals, for we thought they could save us. <clears throat> but when the right time came, the time that God decided on, he sent his son, born of a woman, born as a Jew, to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own sons. And because we are his sons, God has sent the spirit of his son, the Holy Spirit, into our hearts so that we can now rightly speak of God as our dear father. Paul is telling us the second purpose of the law was to be a guardian of God's people until they matured. God had promised Israel great things, but they were too immature to handle all God wanted to do in and through them. But Paul says when Israel matured in the fullness of time, he says, God sent the Messiah, his son Jesus Christ, and he's basically saying, now you're ready to be treated like adults. Or as Galatians 4.4 4 says, When the time had come, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Now, why is Paul talking anyway about the place of the Old Testament, Old Covenant law in the life of a New Covenant, New Testament believer? Well, you see, Paul had taught the Galatians that they didn't have to follow all the Jewish ceremonial law to become a Christian. Then Paul leaves Galatia. After he leaves, he's soon followed by some teachers from Jerusalem who tell the Galatians that following Jesus, believing in Jesus is good, but that's not enough. You also have to follow the Old Testament law. We often call these false teachers Judaizers because they were teaching Gentile Christians they had to follow Jesus and the Old Testament law. Essentially, you had to become a Jew if you were then going to be saved and be a Christian. Well, Paul writes to the Galatians to tell them, no, to live under the law is to turn back to the Old Covenant and ignore the New Covenant of grace that was established in Jesus Christ. Do you know that people are still deceived today in the same way Paul says the Galatians were deceived? There are people today who think you must keep all the Jewish laws to be a good Christian. Seventh-day Adventists are a good example. They're good people, they were, but they worship on Saturday because that was the Sabbath day in the Old Testament. They keep all the dietary laws and a lot of the ceremonial laws of Old Testament Jews. And so do a number of other very conservative Christian groups. They're trying to please God with their obedience, their good works, but they're ignoring the New Testament and the new covenant of grace and the new freedom from all those regulations that we have in Christ. In response to the false teaching the Galatians had received from the Judaizers, Paul writes in Galatians 4, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? It is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by the free woman, one by Hagar and one by Sarah. The one by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way. The one of the free woman was born as a result of a promise. You remember the promise of God. That, that Abraham and Sarah, though they were long past their years of having children, that God would give them a child. And through that child, you know, that God would bless them and that ultimately a Messiah would come. Hagar was the slave girl. It wasn't God's idea, it was Sarah's idea and Abraham's idea that since we're old, I guess what God means is, is that I will have to have, I'll have sex with the slave girl and uh, produce a child. The story that Paul, Paul is using this story to say Hagar represents the law and Sarah represents grace. Hagar, the point Paul is making is Abraham was never supposed to marry Hagar. He was never supposed to have a relationship with Hagar. Likewise, you will never have a personal relationship with God through the law. Abraham had a personal relationship with God through faith. And, Abraham is, and Abraham's true descendants are those who came from God's promised child, Isaac. 
Isaac fulfilled the promise of God and his descendants were God's chosen people through Abraham and Sarah who represent grace extended as a result of God's promise. Just as the Messiah Jesus came into the world as a result of the promises of God throughout the Old Testament to send a Messiah, a Savior. God says, I want to have a relationship with you based on grace, not on your ability to keep the law because you can't have a personal relationship with me in that way. Galatians 4.30 says, what does the scripture say? Get rid of that slave woman and her, and her son. The slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the freed woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of, of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Paul is saying we live by grace, not the law. The point Paul is making is only if we live by grace are we part of the legitimate family of God. He's comparing two families. One family lives by the law. One family lives by grace. He's saying you're not to live by the law. That's not my true family. You are to live in the family of grace instituted by my son, that promised son. That's the way to have a relationship with me. In Colossians, the second chapter, Paul gives us yet an additional understanding of what it means not to live under the law and instead to live under grace. In Colossians 2.13, Paul writes, When you were dead in your sins in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of your sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Is there any way that you can keep all the laws of the Old Testament? No. We have broken so many laws in our lifetime, there's no way we could ever pay the debt of sin we've accumulated. But Jesus paid all of our debts and canceled all the written codes and regulations that condemn us on the cross, Paul says. All the laws we broke are paid for by Jesus when he died on the cross for us. You remember the moment Jesus died, the veil in the temple was split from the top to the bottom. The veil represented that sinful mankind is in the outer courts of the temple and must be separated from the holy God who's in the, inner, uh, in, in the innermost court in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies represented where God was, the outer court represented where man was, and the veil represented a barrier between a holy God and sinful man. God is holy, man is sinful, and the two there never for, can, can never come together. But when Christ dies on the cross, the separation between sinful man and a holy God is removed. Jesus took away our sins and now we have a relationship with a holy God because we are recipients of the righteousness of Christ through his death on the cross. We can now have direct access to God and can now have a true relationship with him. The reality and, the f and fulfillment of the potential of the Christian life is found in having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ who died to make that relationship possible. It's not found in rules. It's not found in regulations. It's not found in religious rituals or in laws. There's one last picture of the law that Paul paints in Romans 7 I want us to look at today. It's the picture of the law as a husband. In Romans 7, Paul writes, Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives? For example, a married woman is bound by her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. So then if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if, she, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. Now, while this passage correctly describes biblical teachings on marriage, that's not primarily what the passage is about. It's not about marriage. Paul is using this as an illustration of the law. The point Paul is making is, is that the law is only valid. You're only married to it as long as you're alive or, and, 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 and it's alive. But when it dies is God's way of relating to mankind. You don't have the same obligation to it as you did when it was, uh, when it was the active way of God uh, relating to man. So as long as a woman is married to a man, she's legally in uh, bound and obligated to that man. As long as a man is married to a woman, he's legally bound and obligated to that woman. The point Paul is making is, before Christ came, the Jews were married to the law, and the law was a harsh, domineering husband. You don't want to be married to the law, is what he's trying to tell all the Christians. This is the kind of husband who comes in, writes a list of do's and don'ts, and sticks it on the refrigerator. 
Can you imagine a marriage like that where the husband comes in and says, here are your regulations for the day? That's not much of a relationship, but that's the kind of relationship the Jews had with the law. But now we've been set free. How are we free from the law? Well, Romans 7, 6 says, but now dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law. Don't ever let anybody tell you you're not released because you are. Paul goes on to say, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. First, the Jews were married to the law, but now Christians are married to Christ. That's the relationship God wants. It's a loving relationship, not a harsh, domineering relationship. It's one of grace. Paul says we obey Christ not out of fear, not because we're commanded to, but because he loves us and because we love him, because he wants the best for us, because he sacrificed himself for us. We're free to love God because we're free from the law that stood between a holy God and sinful man. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd much rather live under the grace of God than under the law of God. Aren't you glad we didn't live in Old Testament times? The lesson here is that we are to serve Christ out of love, not legalism. We serve Christ because he loves us and because we love him. So this phrase, we've been released from the law, we've been freed from the law, what exactly does it mean? How are we free from the law? Well, first, we don't keep the law in order to get to heaven. Keeping the Ten Commandments and the Old Testament law will not get anybody into heaven because nobody can keep them all. We've all stumbled. We've all made mistakes. We don't get to heaven by keeping the law. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore no one, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. The Jews weren't saved by the law. The law was simply given to point out how badly as human beings we blow it, how far we are from the glory of God, and and the fact that we desperately need a Messiah, a Savior. The Jews were saved by looking forward in faith to the Messiah, just as we now look back in faith to the Messiah. People say, well, the Old Testament was all about law and the New Testament is all about grace. But the truth is God's grace is scattered through both Testaments. God has always saved people the same way, by grace through faith. Look at Abraham. God's law, read the book of Hebrews. God's law is simply to show us where we make mistakes and to show us how badly we need a Savior. But no one's ever been saved by the law because no one except Jesus Christ has ever perfectly kept it. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Moses gave the law, but Jesus brings grace and truth. Jesus in John 8.32 said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The law puts you in bondage, but truth sets you free, Jesus says. John 8.36 says, If the Son therefore shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Freedom comes not by the law, but by Christ. Romans 10.4 says, Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Righteousness, a right relationship with God, comes through believing in Jesus Christ and following Him because His righteousness is imputed to us. Second, being free from the law means we're free from the law's punishment. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law and became a curse for, for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The Bible says Jesus took all of the laws that we've broken on himself on the cross. He took the penalty for those sins. He took the curse so you don't have to be cursed by God, have to face the curse of sin and the penalty of sin. Now, what does that mean practically? Well, Romans 8, 1 tells us, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christians are not going to go through judgment in the same way as non-Christians. Christians will go through a determination of rewards, but not condemnation for their sins, because Christ has entirely taken that condemnation and punishment on himself. So in light of all this, how should a Christian relate to the Old Testament law? If we're free from the law, as it's taught all throughout the New Testament, then do we just throw out the Old Testament? Why should we teach the Ten Commandments? How is a Christian to relate to the law? Well, three ways. First of all, the ceremonial law. What what does God say is our relationship to the ceremonial law? Hebrews 8.13 tells us what Christians are to do with all of the ceremonial laws. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. 
and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. You have no obligation at all to keep the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament, the dietary laws, the Sabbath laws, the worship festival laws. Now, that doesn't mean they're not of any value. If you want to know about healthy eating, you know, just read through the Jewish dietary laws. I'm not talking about all the additions that they put around those. But, you know, you just take pork, for instance. You know, they didn't have drugs to deal with cholesterol and hypertension. So God just says, don't eat pigs, and that will do away with a lot of fat in your diet. So, but we're not bound by that anymore. But there are Christian groups, you know, that they won't, they won't eat pork because they feel. Now, if you're doing it for health thing, you know, the Sabbath laws. Jesus said man was made for the Sabbath, not the Sabbath for man. It's not to restrict us, but we do need to have rest. During the French Revolution, they did away with a Sabbath day because they were against the church. But the, the thing was, the health of the nation collapsed. Because people need time to rest, and we need to reflect on God. And so the Sabbath, so there are principles there. The worship festivals, like Passover, you know, many times around Easter, I'll do a sermon on Christ and the Passover, and talk about how you see God pointing toward the Messiah and what it would do, what Jesus would do in the Passover. There's tremendous value. Paul says, the Bible says it's like treasures old and new to know the Old Testament and the New Testament. So it has value. But as far as having to keep it for your salvation... You don't. Jesus said when he initiated the Lord's Supper, this is the new covenant in my blood. The entire book of Hebrews teaches one basic truth. The ceremonial laws of the Old Testament are now unnecessary and abolished. What about the civil law, the laws involving the nation of Israel, and what makes you a Jew? In Ephesians 2, 11 through 16, Paul points out before Christ came, there was a division in humanity between Jews and Gentiles. He, he tells us in Jesus, God not only broke down the wall, the dividing wall between us and God, but he also broke down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. He writes, Therefore remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, the Jews, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember, at the time you were sep at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Paul is talking to people in Ephesus, most of whom are, are Gentiles. He's saying that before Christ came, there wasn't a whole lot of hope for them because the Jews, who were marked by circumcision and separated as a nation by all their dietary and other religious laws and rules, were supposed to be taking God's message to the world, but they hadn't been doing it. But Paul goes on to say, But now in Jesus Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near through the body of Christ, not through circumcision or religious rituals or laws. For he himself is our peace who has made the two one, the two different divisions, Jews and Gentiles, thus making peace and in his body, the church, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. That means there's no longer a need for Old Testament laws that were designed to keep Israel separate and distinct from the other nations. You don't have to follow the Old Testament civil law. But what about the moral law? Which brings us to our text today, Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. We're not bound by the civil law or the ceremonial law. Does that mean we're not bound by the moral law? No, it doesn't. Immediately following verse 14 that I just read, Paul goes on to say, What then? In verse 15, Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? And then he uses the strongest negation that you can have in Greek. By no means it says in English, but that doesn't begin to Catholic. He says, May genotide, may it never, ever, ever be. He's saying we still have a responsibility to the moral law. It has meaning for us today, not as a means of salvation and not as a means to get us to heaven, but it's God's truth, God's guidance on living a life that's pleasing to God. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. These are all things, it was God's guidance to Israel on how do you live the best life, a fulfilling life, a meaningful life, a good life. Paul is talking about the moral law when he writes in Romans 3.3, 3, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. 
Just because we live by grace through faith doesn't give us a license to do anything we want to do. It doesn't mean we have the freedom to act immorally in ways that defy God's moral law because we're defying the way that God says will give us the best life. We still have moral responsibility. It's interesting to me that Paul, who was so adamantly opposed to Gentiles having to keep the law to be saved, and in the book of Romans writes several chapters about the fact that Christians are no longer under the law, still Paul lists in Romans 13, 9, four of the Ten Commandments. He writes, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever, ever com and whatever other commandments there might be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. That's grace, a loving relationship to God and to others, not based on legalistic codes. You don't love God and love others because you have to, because you're required to, but you, 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 you love them because you seek God's love and you want to please God. And the irony is, is as you fulfill the, the law and as you love God and as you follow his instructions and the leadership of the Spirit to love others, you actually fulfill God's moral law. We're to keep the moral law, not to prove ourselves to God, but to find a full and meaningful life and to, and, and to live our lives in a way that uh, is an act of love toward others. You see, there are two extremes, and I'm finishing up here. I know I'm, I'm wearying you with all this. There are two extremes. One is legalism that says, I have to keep all the laws so God will love me and accept me. The other extreme is license that said, I can totally ignore all of the moral laws and do anything I want to do. And as you get into Romans 7, we'll see the balance between legalism and license is liberty. It's grace. It's not legalism, it's not license, it's liber liberty, the freedom to love God and others with abandon and joy and without fear, not because we're required to, but because we want to in response to God's amazing grace. So now we're ready to hear what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17. Jesus says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now that's important. He, he doesn't say that you're going to lose your salvation. He says you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. You won't lose your salvation because you're not saved by the laws. But you'll lose your rewards because you haven't been doing things the way God says this is the right way to do things. Then Jesus goes on to say, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus did not abolish the Ten Commandments or any of the rest of the Old Testament moral law. In Matthew 5, 21, Jesus says, you've heard it sa said, do not murder. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. But he goes on to say, but I tell you, don't even get angry with the kind of anger that destroys other people. In Matthew 5, 27, Jesus said, you've heard it said from the Ten Commandments. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Jesus says, don't even lust after a woman. He takes the commandment a step farther. He makes them not just a matter of our actions, but of our thoughts and the attitudes of our heart because it's all a matter of love, love for others and for God that's made possible by Jesus Christ changing our hearts. So what's the bottom line on the law? We don't keep it to get to heaven. We're free from its punishment. We're free from the penalty of the law. So what value is it to a Christian? 1 Timothy 1.8 tells us, We know that the law is good if a man uses it properly. Not to try to get to heaven. Not to say to God and other people, Hey, look at me, what a good person I am. Not to try to compensate for our sins. We have to use it properly. And what's the proper use of the law? It drives us to Jesus Christ because it reminds us that without Him, we can't love God and others the way He wants us to as Christians. Galatians 3, 23 and 24 says, Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has overcome, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. The law was put in place to lead us to Christ. 
and to keep us continually looking to him, to make us into the men and women he's called us to be because we realize we can't live according to what Christ says on our own. He has given us the Holy Spirit so that we're actually changed day by day to be more like him. And as we're changed day by day to be more like him, then we live a life that's pleasing to God and a blessing to others and ironically that follows the moral law of God. One of the easiest ways that I learned very uh, early in life to think about the law in relationship to Jesus Christ, think about, the, think about Jesus as the good shepherd who t- gave his life for the sheep, the good shepherd of the 23rd Psalm that walks with us, you know, leads us into green pastures and beside the still waters, and think of the law as the shepherd's dog. Now, the shepherd's dog is good. It helps protect you. Whenever you get out of line, the shepherd's dog is nipping at your heels. If you start breaking the moral law of the Old Testament, I assure you, if you're a Christian, God will give you no peace. God uses the the law to convict us of our sins, to drive us to Christ. But for Pete's sake, don't follow the shepherd's dog. He may run off to chase a deer or a rabbit or something. You know, follow the shepherd. The dog is good. There's nothing the matter with the law. It's just that that's not the good shepherd. Keep the main thing the main thing. Find your hope in Jesus Christ. He doesn't cause us to rebel against a bunch of rules and regulations. He just says, follow me. My way, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And as we do that, the ironic thing is we actually live the lives that the law would have had us to live But it brings out the rebellion in our fallen human nature so that we can never live that way because we want to prove that we don't have to. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word that speaks across the ages. Every text is not easy, and the book of Romans is certainly not, which is why we're breaking it into pieces. But Father, I pray that you would give us spiritual ears to hear what you're saying to us. Father, your son said that he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And he's trying to show us the way, Father, and your law shows us the way. You tell us what to do, but it demands of us. It says you have to, and it doesn't change our hearts. But Father, when we ask Christ into our hearts and when we begin to follow him and yield our life to his spirit, you begin to change us from the inside out. And we begin to do the things that we should do, not because we have to do them, but because we want to do them to please you because you've been so wonderful to us and patient with us and forgiven us so much. Father, I can't imagine how you could love me or any of us with all the rebellion, with all the things that we know are right to do and we don't, yet you show patience for us again and again and again. Help us to hear your word, to come unto you, all who are weary and heavy laden, and you will give us rest as we rest in you. Father, I pray for any person who's here, who because of their background, maybe because of teaching before, that that their faith has just been a burden to them, always convicting them, always saying that you're not living up, you're failing, you're failing, and so that Satan uses actually their, their attempt to live for Christ uh, he uses it to beat, down, beat them down. Father, I, help, I pray that as we study the book of Romans, we would find the freedom that we're to have in Jesus Christ that lifts us up. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your son who died on the cross for us. In Christ's name, amen.